Ah, welcome back to the Conspiracy Cast with Robert Evans, where every week I try to put irresponsibly out something that sends a, a chunk of our listeners down a very dark road. Now, Margaret, you were just telling us all that you've been snowed in recently. Yeah. You, 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 what, what, why don't you talk to me about that just a little bit? Okay. Uh, it snows. I live rurally. I can only, I can get out with my, you know, giant pickup truck or whatever, but the mail can't get up the driveway, the gravel road. So you, you, you were, you were, you know, what happens when there's so much snow that it's difficult to leave your house? How, how would you describe that state of affairs? I love it. I'm a prepper. My house is completely self-sustaining. Even if the power <laughs> goes out, I like. Yeah. Margaret, is it true that you secretly were in the United States military and stole government documents? Oh, I'm snowed in. <laughs> Uh, that took a lot of setup that was mostly failure, but <laughs> I had no idea it was all, it was all it. worth it in the end. <laughs> was, was it, was it really? Uh, yep. It sure was. <laughs> I was surprised that you're, you're sticking to these like low level. I mean, that stuff you were just saying is true, mm-hmm. but I'm surprised that you haven't gotten into the real conspiracy about how gold is actually corrosive, and it destroys your your brain if you're um, near large quantities of it. Wow, Margaret. Uh, I mean, what's the responsible thing to do then with all of your gold if you have it and you can feel it impacting your brain? Robert, you should bury your gold. I, I think that's too dangerous. I think people need to send their gold to our P.O. box, and our specially oh. trained Auromancers will, uh, will, will decontaminate the gold. Um, and, and find a safe place to bury it. We'll put the Midas touch. <laughs> That's right. That's our motto. <laughs> is, yeah. is this the last episode of the series? <laughs> this is the last episode of the series. All right. We have, to, um, we, have to, we have to get, we have to get all, all of all the last bits in mm-hmm. now before it ends. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and speaking of ending, um, it's about to be the end of Carrie's life. Um, not a particularly long life. Um, with the exception of Bob Wilson, uh, none of like the kind of most prominent early Discordians live crazy long. Life. There's a couple of them that, that, Except that JFK. Right. there's a lot of guys. Yeah. After JFK is still, still bouncing around down in Texas after fighting that mummy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's, he's kind of like the last years of his life. He spends rambling throughout the South and, and making zines in Atlanta's little five points neighborhood. Um, one of the ways he gets by kind of, he never really makes a profit at it, but like if you, if you send him a dollar, he will send you a bunch of random uh, wall newspapers. Um, and if you send him a letter saying, I don't have any money, he'll also send you a bunch of random wall newspapers. Aww. Basically, if you send Carrie either currency or anything else, he'll send you a bunch of his zines. And that's, he just, he's kind of able to maintain a marginal like living by doing that. That's like um, what we al- do, but with gold, we, if you send us gold, we will either <laughs> send you a zine or not. Yeah, we one of one of those two things will happen. Um, and if you later encounter a zine in like a, a bar or something, just assume that was us too. Yeah. Um, and that way, if you don't receive anything, you won't feel ripped off. Now, the other thing that happens in this is that, like, again, all these kind of like punk kids are coagulating in little five points because it's a place you can get by um, without having sort of a very regular income. There's not like a lot of attention from the local government on that part of town yet. And all of these people, particularly a lot of young punk ladies, find Carrie and kind of adopt him as a guru. Um, the, that oh, feels uh, like a position uh, he should yes. not. <laughs> he should not be in. <laughs> yes. Um, this there there are some problems with this. These these young women who call themselves the Thornleyettes. Um, Ooh, because yeah, no, I that know, is, that's not that nope. is not good for Carrie. That's not the thing. What this guy's brain needs. Um, now again, Carrie never seeks treatment in or help in any meaningful way. Um, and his conspiratorial beliefs continue to evolve. This starts with kind of his anger at his ex-wife, but it, eventually he becomes convinced that both her and every woman that he has ever slept with, like every woman who approaches him, who hits on him, are all part of a conspiracy. They're all Nazis who were secretly sent over to the United States <laughs> to have sex with him and breed a future Fuhrer. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, he has he has just like fully fallen into his own his own hole that he dug. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um and you know, that's actually very sad, but it like is also kind of TikTok. funny. <laughs> yeah, like, like the kid on TikTok. There's a kid on TikTok who's like a a fan fiction kid who like does yeah, some sort of part of nerd culture I'm not familiar with, but he has convinced himself that he's the reincarnation of Adolf Hitler or and has gotten a like nose piercing oh, that when his hair is styled a certain way, he looks kind of like honestly not a bad resemblance. And I'm going to be I'm again no, to, to be no. totally fair, if Hitler was reincarnated, that's exactly the kind of person he'd be in 2023. Oh, I bet his dad I know is my Hitler. <laughs> Robert <laughs> Uh, yeah. Robert no. can't take all the blame for that one. No, Unfortunately no. Unfortunately not. Get get did. get get ready for the six part series on Twink Hitler coming mm-hmm. up. Oh, I that's that's gonna be more than six parts, Garrison. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the Twinkler. We're just launching a new weekly. Oh god. Keep keeping up with him. Um so one thing that seems undeniable um, is that Carrie's belief in a conspiracy behind the JFK assassination only deepened with time. Um, he came to be convinced that he was a central part of the plot. And one of his last public appearances was in 1992 on a TV show called A Current Affair. We're going to play a segment from this. Let's just let's just watch this incredible piece of 1990s television uh, starring our friend Carrie Thornley. She emerges from the shadows. Okay. Grim shadows that have cast a pall over a man with a frightening secret, a terrible boast. I wanted to shoot him. I wanted to assassinate him very much. You have just seen and heard a man called Carrie Thornley, who used the exotic background of New Orleans as his headquarters for a deranged plot to assassinate President John F. Kennedy. His one regret? His good friend and Marine buddy, Lee Harvey Oswald, got there before him. In fact, he was so close to Oswald that he even wrote a book about him before the assassination. Now again, listen to the words of Terry Thornley and shot him. I want him dead. I would have shot him myself. I would have stood there with a rifle and pulled the trigger if I'd had the chance. Terry Thornley talked for the first time in history about the ugliest competition imaginable. A race to kill. President Kennedy. And Thornley wants the world to know he tried his hardest. I told the Secret Service, I said the only reason I didn't kill him was because I wasn't in the right place at the right time with a gun. The world met Terry Thornley in 1964. So, you see what's happened here. Number one, Kerry, it's moved on from like, you know, I was mind controlled to like, I had my own plan to kill Kennedy and I was like fighting with Oswald to pull it off. But what's really happening here more than anything is that these like sleazy daytime TV fucks are using yeah. a very sick man in order to make content. Um, also, and, like, they this stole is, his mustache. They stole his mustache. He does have like an Amish beard do. Um, but that's pretty messed up. Like he's, they, it's very, they're like framing all of this almost like an episode of like unsolved mysteries in between as they cut through to like this footage of Carrie walking down like a darkened street and everything. Yeah. Um, it's pretty exploitative. Um, yeah. but yeah, that's kind of like the last big public thing that Carrie does. And I, I I'm not one sad. for conspiracy theories. It is kind of sad. I'm not, you know, one for conspiracies, but from, uh, just in order to be perfectly, um, responsible, I do think I need to show you both the, uh, the logo for the show that he has his last appearance on. Oh, it's a pyramid. It's a pyramid. Yeah, there's a pyramid directly behind the A Current Affair logo. So true. Interesting. Interesting. What year was this? Um, this is 1992. So this is this is a year after he, after he published uh, Zenarchy, which is kind of one of one of yeah. a weirdly long lasting text that yes. he wrote towards the end of his life. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, that's uh, that's kind of his last like TV type appearance. Although I think the last appearance he actually makes is right before he passes on. He dies in ninety eight. Um, a bunch of because Discordians were some of the very first people on the internet. We're talking like Usenet days, and like th- th- there were a bunch of different kind of fan websites to Thornley and Bob Anton Wilson and all, all of these other guys. And one of them gets him and like sits down with him and conducts a live chat session interview where a bunch of Discordians around the world are able to like ask him questions. 
And I think it's one of the first times anyone had done this. This is the late 1990s. So there's not a lot of people who beat him to that sort of thing that is now like the language through which fandoms are conducted, um, which is also interesting. I was I was uh, terminally online in the late 90s. And uh, I was telling Garrison about this, that I was a lot of overlap with um Discordian and especially like Church of Subgenius and all of these sorts of things. Um, and so it's just like, that just really tracks to me. And it was like these like slightly older people who were like the cool weirdos on the internet that I was like, whoa, look at these cool weirdos on the internet. And I would go on IRC chat and like yeah, meet all these Discordians. Now, unfortunately, Carrie in the state that he's in is not taking he's not like visiting a doctor regularly. And he also just doesn't have access to um, particularly good health care. Um, and this becomes particularly a problem when he gets evicted by the city. They kind of like come in and clean house in little five points and kick out a lot of like the crusty radicals. Mm -hmm. And so he and a bunch yeah, of yeah. these kids all wind up sleeping in a very specific forest in Atlanta where he gets sick and is eventually hospitalized and dies. Um, Wild. And that happens in November of 1998. He is 60 years old when this occurs. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's interesting. Um, and is it's, that the specific forest that is now being turned into Cop City? Uh, as far as I can tell, yeah. I mean, it's it's right outside a little five points. But if if, if, you, if you have more details certain. on that, I could I could probably confirm that. Um, I, if you I have not found them, but I yeah, it, it it's worth l looking into because it. I mean, it, it is, is the the Milani Forest is just like a few miles directly south from Little Five Points. Yeah. There is there is a road that connects you straight from from Little Five Points toward yeah. to that section of the forest. In the late eighties, that or sorry, in the late nineties, that, that that would have been right right after the city shut down that area of forest that operated as a prison farm. Um, mm. So that would have been a, it would kind of entered its first stage of like not really being used for anything for the next like twenty twenty years or so. Yeah, um, yeah, huh. it's it's not a kind of thing I know exactly. It, it, they just say like the forest kind of near little five points, but interesting. Yeah, it's kind it, of it, one of the last places he spends any time. So he's actually still yeah. living. I'm sorry, this whole making up conspiracy <laughs> thing is too much fun. So yeah. he's still living under the forest, and um, I don't know where to go from there. If only. Um, obviously, he is not a man who had an easy life. Uh, the the high Discordian leaders did not, in general, have easy lives. Um, Greg Hill, as we've said, kind of collapses mentally after his divorce from his wife. Um, he gets a job. He eventually becomes a like upper mid-level executive at bank of america oh and, that's that's whoa. such a bummer well yeah it's even sadder than that because he he will work as a bank executive during the day and then for the rest of his life he just comes home he does not interact with anyone and he drinks himself to death he drinks himself to death like it's a job oh. um yeah. yeah and that is that is how greg hill leaves the world um, Robert Anton Wilson lives the longest of, of the guys we've been talking about into the early 2000s. Um, he is a much healthier person. Uh, there are some like criticisms of him. He kind of he has some like very specific critiques of feminism that I think some people have uncharitably compared to being an early men's rights advocate. That's not actually what I mean, for one thing, his wife was a, a fairly influential feminist activist in her day. He had a lot of specific issues with specific things certain feminists were saying that he criticized, but was not like anti-woman in, in, in any particular way. Now, he is he is a guy in who's writing shit in the 60s and 70s, um, which right. evolves like, over yeah, time, right? Like, there's some misogyny you can find in his early stuff. He also, He's like, an editor from Playboy. Like, yeah. Yeah, at he's the time when who, a lot of the yeah. feminism is specifically anti-porn also. Yeah, yeah. He, he is someone who changes over time, and nothing that I've seen of his is, like, like hateful, you know, like he's no, not no. like a, a cruel or a violent person. He's just, you know, if you if you go in and read a bunch of his stuff, you'll find some stuff that doesn't age well and some stuff that you disagree with, yeah, which yeah. is going to be the case with everybody who thought of things that were interesting at any point in history. Not me, um, though. Not 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 no, Margaret. I future proof all blameless. of my work, actually. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and not me. You can find Maya. It's actually kind of a, a sequel to Zen Anarchy. It's called Put the Lead Back in the Gas Tanks, comma, fuck them kids. And it's sort of my manifesto. Um, and I, I think really people are going to get a lot of good 
out of that. I also think bicycle helmets should be illegal. So, you know, check that book out. Follow my five pillars of making sure children don't graduate school at accelerated rates. Um, all good stuff. Uh, school zone speed limit should be 55 miles an hour. It's interesting because as we're kind of discussing, like, the the end of the lives of these people, um, a, a few years before... Of, of, of a few years before Greg Hill uh, died, he gave an interview um, to Loom Panics. Yeah, and he <laughs> Loom Panics he is like a was a publisher for both weird left wing and right wing esoterica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he 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 talked about how like um his pen name Malaclips the younger uh, he like described it as like a, as like a spirit that like entered him and he was mm-hmm. he was he was he was he was, he was able to like channel writing through through the spirit which is why he credited the work to to this to to this to this entity but he also says that like um that the entity kind of left him once yeah once principia was done writing he, he kind of like it left and like that yeah that part of him was, was like it like disappeared o- over we'll, time we'll actually talk a little bit more about that in a second i've got a okay. quote from him you'll find interesting Oh, awkward interjection. Robert forgot to do the ad break back when he was supposed to, so we're editing this in crudely, probably in the middle of a sentence being spoken by Garrison, and we'll probably come back from this ad break mid-sentence spoken by Garrison, just just to fuck with him. But yeah, Bob Wilson is the guy who kind of lives the longest and he, you know, his, the last years of his life are racked with pain due to post polio syndrome, but he, he remains extremely productive. And the thing that he has that, that I don't think really any of the others had, uh, particularly not Hill and Thornley, Bob Wilson is a weirdo. He's into all this esoteric shit. He's also a professional, like a professional writer who writes for a massive publication. He knows how to package ideas in ways to get a lot of people to pay attention to them. And so it's Bob Wilson, it's his work that's going to kind of bring Discordianism to its widest audience and also have the biggest long-term cultural impact in mainstream conceptions of the Illuminati. Because that's the thing that Wilson does the most, that Wilson's work does the most. In 1975, Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea, his fellow editor at Playboy, start to publish a series of three novels, eventually known as the Illuminatus Trilogy. The book is a very weird uh, piece of fiction. Um, one of the things they're doing during this is like every chapter, basically, they switch off. And so they were kind of trying to write each other every chapter into a corner that the other couldn't get out of. Um, <laughs> so it is... <laughs> Fucking assholes. <laughs> I know. It's, it's a... It's a it's not structured the way most books are. The foundational premise is that all conspiracy theories, even the conflicting ones, are true, and the history of the world is largely determined by a secret war being waged between the all-controlling Illuminati and the Discordians, who are like the insurgents fighting against the Illuminati and also are part of the Illuminati. It's a very, <laughs> it's that kind of book. Um, and again, one of the things actually, because like there, everyone is a double agent, right? And like the the Discordians are actually deeply enmeshed in the Illuminati. One of the things that's happening here that Wilson is talking about is the fact that if you were a radical in the 60s, you came to the realization that like a significant chunk of the people you organized with were feds. And so like that's one of the reasons why all of this is like that's such a like there's so many different like quadruple agents and stuff in this in this series. Um, So also just like working for like mainstream publications. uh, Yeah, you're you're critiquing capitalism or participating in capitalism. And I don't actually think that's like bad obviously um yeah. but it's it's messy and it could leave you with that sort of sense of i don't know yeah and it's 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 a very messy book and so this is a hugely influential book you you it, it, you know uh, we'll talk about this in a second but like you it's one of those things that's influential in ways that are mostly not super visible because when people put hints and references to this stuff in their work they're often very coy about it. And just because of how influential this was and sort of conceptions of the Illuminati and conspiracies, a lot of it's faded into the background um, since then. Um, but yeah, I want to, I think probably the best way of kind of talking about the way this stuff works is the, um, the idea of the 23 Enigma, which is a, a big thing in the Illuminatus trilogy. And it's, it's basically what, like, one of the things that Wilson does in this book is he finds there's all these different specific 
dates in history that are influential that involve the number 23. Um, there's a lot of like very specific fucked up historical shit that happens in 1923. And, and he'll, he'll pull all of these different dates and moments and stuff together. Um, because if you start listing enough stuff like that, the kind of pattern recognition chunk of your brain lights up and you start to attach a specific like significance to the number 23. Um, and so like Wilson's kind of goal here, this was another little way of bringing people to Chapel Perilous is if you kind of like list out all these different ways that the number 23 is significant in history, um, maybe people will start to question whether or not the Illuminati is like picking spits, you know, is there a conspiracy that's doing certain things that's carrying out all these assassinations and revolutions on dates that have a 23 in them? Um, are they doing it because like they're trying to signal to people what they're doing? Is this some sort of message or is it just like, yeah, you know, a bunch of like, like if it, there's enough things happening in the world that if you like pull out every significant event that happened on the 23rd day of a month, you'll get a bunch of weird shit. Right. Which is the where I tend to land on things. But um, this kind of like works. Number one, if you read the Illuminatus trilogy, you're going to wind up like just noticing 23s forever. But also <laughs> because of how influential the books are, sit down and watch the fucking wire. Right. And see how many 23s you see on the back of squad cars or in. Uh, people's shirts and jackets watch like any big show and keep an eye out for the number 23 and you'll note that it shows up more often than it seems like it should and is this just because michael jordan is a popular basketball player that's certainly some of it um or does a lot of it have to do with the fact that a bunch of the people who were making particularly the tv shows that went big in the late 90s early 2000s had been fans of this stuff and stuck 23s into their work well that's also the case and because of like like how effectively Bob does this and how many people pick up on this and start sticking 23s into art and television and stuff, a conspiracy, an actual conspiracy develops over the number 23 that it's somehow tied to, you know, the secret society running the world, which culminates in a 2007 film starring Jim Carrey titled 23. Um, Wait, which, I've never even maybe, heard of this movie. <laughs> oh yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a big deal uh, back in the day. I guess this is like um, the era when I like really lived under a rock. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, the thing that Bob Wilson is doing is he's he's basically taking advantage of the human brain's gift for pattern recognition because it 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 can kind of for, for one thing, when you get people locked into this pattern, then when you reveal things that have to do with like the number 23, it feels like more of a reveal. Right. It just mm -hmm. kind of like works narratively. And also Bob Wilson liked fucking with people and uh, it, it this like had a clear impact, but it also has kind of formed. This is the baseline of a lot of the tactics that are used by conspiracists today, um, because the way that social media works, if you can start like seeding in references to conspiracies in a bunch of ways that go viral, when people start seeing all this shit popping up on their timeline and maybe it comes up on their timeline in a moment that's particularly significant to them and then they put more weight into it. Like all of this stuff is a lot easier to do. Bob had to draw you in to a a thousand page fiction book to like yeah. tweak people's heads with this shit. Now you can do that at scale using algorithms on Twitter and YouTube and shit. Well, and, like, and people have, it's like publicity stuff. It's like in publicity, you, you expect someone to not buy a product until like the 10th time they hear it. And this is yeah. like, this is true for fucking anarchists and radicals and whatever also, right? Like, like if you're trying to sell a book or you're trying to get people to have interest in a book, they're not going to do anything about it the first several times they hear it. And so it is really interesting that it's the same strategy. Yeah. And it's, it's the goal of my operation Mindfuck, Bob Wilson's goal. And these guys are all folks who are on the left. They're all people who are also activists is like to kind of, um, Robert Guffey, who's, who's written a book called Operation Mindfuck and writes about this, summarizes the goal as like, they want to break the trance that kept America at war, blindly consuming and oblivious to its impact on the rest of the world, destabilize the dominant cultural narrative through pranks and confusion. Like, that was essentially the goal. But as Guffey notes, over the ensuing decades, it was the progressive left whose ideas wound up being mainstreamed. Really, from All in the Family onward, it was progressive values in fictional TV, Maud to M.A.S.H., Murphy Brown to The West Wing. And as that became the dominant cultural narrative, Operation Mindfuck became a tool of the alt-right. Um, oh, shit, and that, yeah. That is, over time, kind of what you see, is as... A lot of the stuff, not all of it, obviously, these guys are much more radical than the fucking West Wing. But as 
some of this, like these attitudes towards, um, you know, militarism and shit and, and, and attitudes towards like, you know, uh, sexual liberation and um, like that kind of stuff, like radical political equality and whatnot, as those become more mainstreamed, the, um, the, it, it's like the, the toolbox loses its power for that side. Right. But becomes a more powerful tool of the people who are now kind of the insurgents. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the point that Guffy is making. There's d- degrees to which I disagree with him, but I think he's kind of like broadly looking at this in a way that's 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 useful. Well, so why um, we don't why we don't um, assign like we don't hold tactics sacred is because yes. like tactics themselves are applicable in certain contexts and not in other contexts and can be used by all kinds of people. So if there's not a moral weight attached to a tactic, then I don't feel bad if the right wing is using Operation Mindfuck type stuff because of course they are because if they're the underdogs, that's what they'll no. use. Like, Yeah, it's like I said, it's a gun on, a, on the table, right? Like yeah. That's what they've done is they've built a gun and they set it down on the table. Yeah. Um, you know, they try, They used it first and we can, I think it's, you know, arguable mm-hmm. like the degree to which it was successful or not um and i i do think it's interesting <laughs> because uh, one of the things like we're trying both to talk about sort of the broader impact on american politics and culture that the aftershocks of operation mindfuck had but the other story is the impact that it had on like conspiracy culture itself and even like the conception of the illuminati and this has a lot to do with the fact that again robert wilson and robert shea are both really good writers from like a capitalist standpoint in terms of their ability to write things that spread and can be sold. Mm -hmm. Um, And this has led a lot of creators to adapt their work. They're also very influenced by H.P. Lovecraft, who was kind of an early creative commons uh, uh, advocate in in a lot of ways. Um, Like they wouldn't have used those terms, but he was this advocate of like, yeah, people should be taking my stories and this mythos that I've built and writing their own stories in it. And that's also kind of the attitude that Wilson and Shea seem to have towards a lot of this. And so a lot of people adapt versions of the Illuminatus trilogy. Um, And this leads to in the early 1990s, when uh, Kerry Thornley is going on that TV show to talk about how he was racing his buddy Oswald to kill Kennedy, a little Austin-based pen and paper game company called Steve Jackson Games makes a card game. And Steve Jackson Games makes a lot of card games. They mm-hmm. Munchkin is probably their biggest seller now. But they make a game in the early 90s called Illuminati New World Order. And it's based in part on the Illuminatus trilogy and in part on just like shit in the news. Um, and the 1994 edition of this game includes a card called Terrorist Nuke. And Margaret, how would you describe <laughs> that card? That is a picture of the World Trade Center's being <laughs> blowed up. And not blowed up from the bottom. Like No, n- not from the bottom. From about where that plane hit it. Yeah. <laughs> and I it, have uh, this card. It gives plus 10 power uh, or resistance mm-hmm. your choice to any violent mm-hmm. group you control with violent is That's capitalized. Right. That's right. Well, it certainly gave plus 10 power to the American government. <laughs> there, there's another card. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it just it shows the Pentagon exploding in a particular section and the way that the <laughs> Pentagon exploded. Yeah. I mean, the band The Coup put out like them hanging out in front of some blowed up world towers. Like, I think that mm-hmm. week or some shit, like mm-hmm. it's just an idea whose time had I'm not even going to finish that sentence. No, it, yeah, it, 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 it certainly it, it was an image that many people had thought of before it happened. It, yeah. That is yeah. like there's even stuff like in The Simpsons. There, there's yeah. there's stuff all over of of things resembling 9/11 that happened in like the two decades prior. Mm-hmm. I will say none of them quite as much as this resembles. Yeah, no, 9/11. absolutely. Yeah. It is a little striking. Yeah. Um, now, the almost startling prescience of this card and the fact that it came from a card game called Illuminati New World Order <laughs> led to viral conspiracy <laughs> theories that the actual Illuminati had faked the 9-11 attacks and used this card game as what Alex Jones called predictive programming to seed awareness of their crimes. The crowning moment of this particular conspiracy theory came when Osama bin Laden was assassinated in 2011. The CIA gained access to his hard drive and the contents of this hard drive are now all publicly available. Uh, They contain a PDF titled Smoking Gun, proof that Illuminati planned terrible events many years ago to bring down our culture. The article that follows is an exhaustive dissection of the Illuminati card game (laughs) on Osama bin Laden's hard drive. 
I, now again, Steve Jackson's game be... must have made bank off of this. They were just sitting back being like, yeah, well, yeah. And the, the other thing that happens right around this time is they're making like a cyberpunk role playing game, which includes a bunch of hacking shit. And because the FBI, especially in the early 90s, is not very doesn't know anything about computers, they like freak out and raid Steve Jackson games. <laughs> so like after this comes out, there's a massive federal raid on this gaming company. <laughs> it's all a coincidence. I mean, th- this is and especially when this shit shows up on bin Laden's hard drive, like this is a lot of people's chapel perilous moment, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah, why yeah. the hell would this be in his hard drive? And obviously there was we'll so never much know. shit on his hard drive. There was so much shit, including like all of the fucking Looney Tunes cartoons you could yeah. ever want. Um, but if you're if a part of your brain at any point in this went like, huh, I wonder if something weird is going on. I mean, that you know, that's Operation Mindfuck working as intended. Yeah. Um, now, the Illuminatus trilogy, ironically, made the Illuminati real to millions of people. This is due in part to the relevance of the books themselves. Uh, in the late 1980s, the Illuminatus trilogy was made into a stage play, which was so popular, it launched the careers of Bill Nye and Jim Broadbent. The Queen of England attended the opening. <laughs> um, it is a weirdly influential play. Um so, uh, yeah, the Queen of England attends this play based on this ridiculous series of books. Um, and of course, Illuminati imagery. We're just we're posting this on a day when like Elon Musk posted an Illuminati meme. Jay-Z and Beyonce have incorporated Illuminati symbolism into their acts, which have convinced a lot of people that they are, in fact, in the Illuminati. Um In 2015, research uh, suggested that about half the U.S. population believes in at least one conspiracy theory, and one of the most popular is the existence of the Illuminati. I suspect it's probably over half at this point. The QAnon conspiracy theory is in... A lot has happened to reality since 2015. And and honestly, if you look at... (laughs) Reality stopped existing. Yeah, yeah, we well, I mean, consensus we, reality took a big hit. Yeah. We all there were. It's almost like you know, if you want to view society as like uh, 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 some fucking like worm traveling through the soil, we hit a rock and burst into pieces, and like that's now you've got a bunch of little worms that formed out of the carcass of that big worm, and we're all tunneling in different directions, and some of us have wound up in piles of shit, huh? Yeah, no, that maybe is better. I use an Although ice that's good for worms. as so, the, like, yeah. the way of understanding majority reality is, like, the ice is thicker where more people mm-hmm. are and stuff, and, like, yeah. out on the edge is, like, where some of the more fringe things happens, and there's no value in something being fringe or not, right? Like, much like Operation Mindfuck, it's, like, there's no value yeah. in fucking with people's heads. And so, yeah, sometimes it just feels like we fucking, the ice flow just split in half. Yeah, and this is, um, you know, obviously, like, QAnon conspiracy theory is a rebranded Illuminati conspiracy theory. They are taking the joke that these guys made about how the CIA and the Republican Party and the Democratic Party and the anarchists and yada yada, we're all, you know, part of the conspiracy together. The like, academics, just taking, the universities, yeah, exactly, the people exactly. in the media, the yeah. their anti even caps. Even, even yeah. the current fucking stuff with, like, you know, the... Uh, the 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 elites pushing gender ideology and all like the anti trans yeah. stuff is just is just another version of the Illuminati. Like it's all the yeah. same shit. As and if also, any of those people would get my pronouns right, as if any mm-hmm. of the people that they think are like controlling yeah. and trying to make everyone trans would like fucking get my pronouns right. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting too because um uh the what you actually kind of see here because it's not just the Discordians that like Discordian attitudes towards the Illuminati that have been taken up by QAnon. They're kind of merging the Discordian depiction of the Illuminati with the John Birch Society's depiction of the Illuminati. So like, like that's really what you've seen happen here, which is such a strange thing, but I I don't see any other way to kind of parse out the intellectual DNA of this movement. Um, Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because at this point, for one thing, some of the first people to recognize what was happening with the alt right and like what was happening kind of, with all of these different social movements, these right wing social movements that have spread through conspiracies over the Internet, we're old Discordians. Um, and a lot of these people have kind of come to the conclusion that not only did Operation Mindfuck fail in its initial noble goal, but it had been subverted and turned into a weapon. And I'm going to quote from Guffy here again. 
The parallels between the Discordian goddess Eris and the Egyptian frog-headed god Kek should be obvious. Both were created to represent the spirit of chaos, disruption, and anti-authoritarianism. In many alt-right memes, Kek resembles Donald Trump with a frog-like face. Oddly enough, depicting Trump as a half-human, half-reptilian hybrid is meant to be a compliment to the president. In the 1990s, conspiracy theorist David Icke grew to fame by traveling around the world, accusing various world leaders of being shape-shifting reptilians in disguise. Today, Trump supporters clothe him in a reptilian form as a tribute. They perceive him to be a cold-blooded agent of pure chaos. I was literally yeah. just looking up all of the stuff linking the Pepe Keck thing to the to yeah the, the 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 entire way that 4chan was using this like specifically influenced by the Operation Mindfuck stuff specifically mm-hmm. influenced by like the Chaos Magic stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, it's uh, it's fucked up, and you're you're not gonna f- obviously the odds that. Donald Trump himself knows any of this are basically zero, but the odds that there are people in his orbit who were aware of a lot of this history are quite a bit higher and you're not going to find smoking guns here. Um, but there, there are some things that I've read over the years that set like, send me back to that chapel perilous space. Um, I'm going to quote from an article in the guardian, and this is from way back when the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. Like if you can remember then. So this is, this is an article about the Cambridge Analytica scandal. As Wiley describes it, he was the gay Canadian vegan who somehow ended up creating, quote, Steve Bannon's psychological warfare mindfuck tool. In 2014, Steve Bannon, then executive chairman of the alt-right news network Breitbart, was Wiley's boss, and Robert Mercer, the secret U.S. hedge fund billionaire and Republican donor, was Cambridge Analytica's investor, and the idea they brought into being was to bring big data and social media to an established military methodology, information operations, then turn it on the U.S. electorate. Now... Is Wiley using the term mindfuck just because that's the term that is most appropriate? Is he using it because as the kind of guy who'd get this job, he's familiar with this history? Or is he using it because it's a term that he heard around the office? And then why were the people using it? Like, right, you can you can drive yourself into some interesting areas if you read too much into a a, a fucking quote from a, a Guardian article where a guy happens to use the word mindfuck while talking about a psychological warfare tool. Um, but I do that sometimes when I'm reading about the Illuminati at four in the morning. You mean because you're in the Chapel Perilous right now? <clears throat> Almost permanently, yeah. So, research in 2016 by Viren Swamy, a psychology professor, suggests that conspiracy theory believers are more likely to be suffering from stressful life situations than non-believers. And what I find interesting about this is that the toolbox built by the Discordians, merged with the reach of social media, gives bad actors a way to create stressful life situations for millions of people, which draw them deeper into conspiracism while alienating them yeah. from their families and thus making them more vulnerable, right? I mean, this is a good, a big thing on QAnon. A lot of people that fall into this are not are are not actually like like they're actually doing fine like a lot of them are like suburban republican moms who like are living life pretty good but the invention of this conspiracy theory throws their life in into shambles because they now they like it 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 creates these stressful conditions that otherwise kind of well-off and privileged people uh are already existing in yeah and it's it's that that is like part of you know to the extent that you want to throw put blame on the original discordians some of what makes this tool set so dangerous didn't exist when they invented it right like all of the stuff that has been done using kind of the basis they established wasn't possible back in the 1960s um but yeah it it is worth noting though that like i just said that but as garrison brought up earlier among the first discordians there was a pretty widespread understanding that they were at least potentially fiddling with something dangerous and i'm going to quote from jmr higgs here Greg Hill was an atheist who intended Discordianism to be a satire of religion. He certainly did not start out taking the idea of goddesses or spirits seriously. By the late 70s, however, he was convinced that his Discordian adventures had stirred up something that he was unable to explain. As he told his friend Margot Adler, if you do this type of thing well enough, it starts to work. I started out with the idea that all gods are an illusion. By an end, I had learned that it is up to you to decide whether gods exist. And if you take the goddess of confusion seriously enough, it will send you through as profound and valid a metaphysical trip as taking a god like Yahweh seriously. Yep. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, this is this is this is funny. Just uh, right, right, right before we started recording there, this video came out of of Charlie Kirk talking about how he got sick because some witches like like cursed him and like. 
the the first step for for magic to be effective is that you have to believe in the magic so the fact that charlie kirk believes that witches can make him sick means that he has now opened up the possibility in his brain to get sick because of magic so now people can do that and he's and he will get sick because this is how your brain works like this is like actual like science stuff with the placebo effect with the nocebo effect that the fact that he's decided that witches can can cause him physical damage means that witches can now cause him physical damage and um, because we have so many listeners to this podcast and and i think there is a, a great stored potential in their mental energy if you have some time today when you listen to this everyone just think about giving charlie kirk chlamydia Let's all just let's all just work on that together psychically. Just a little bit of the clap for old Charlie Kirk. I think we can do it. All you have to do is visualize his face getting smaller and smaller <laughs> until he until he develops a series of horrible rashes. <laughs> so Throughout the 1990s in particular, the tactics of the Discordians merged with things like the Situationists and groups like Up Against the Wall motherfuckers, which had all kind of existed in the same period that the Discordians got started. One of the things that gives the Discordians longevity is that there are kind of follow-up cults to the original cult, the Church yeah. of the Subgenius being the most well-known, that is basically rebranded Discordian. Bob Wilson is a part of it. Um, and this kind of keeps a lot of like the stuff that they had been putting out relevant. Um, and as a result, they have a big influence in the spread of a widespread left-wing cultural practice called culture jamming by anti-consumerist activists in the 1990s. Well, and, and speaking of anti-consumerism and, and, and Church of the Subgenius, one mm -hmm. thing they put out was a lot of fake advertising. Mm -hmm. um, just like and just like, just, none of these just products like, are real. Just like the fake ads you're about to hear. Nothing you're about to hear is a real product. No, All no, these are no, fake. This, this show is entirely supported by the CIA working with the John Birch Society. Yeah. So, All fake products, we, but you still money. have to listen. You still have to yeah. listen to them or else it mm -hmm. won't work. So yeah. Yeah, it'll break the illusion. All right, we're back. My favorite uh, of those ads was the one where uh, JFK was talking about his new podcast where he talks to celebrities. The deep fake JFK podcast is actually pretty good. It is it is Wait, shocking how fucking... clear th they make his voice and it, it it flows very consistently. A lot of AI voices are kind of janky, but the deep fake oh, JFK God. voice is actually one of the better ones that I've heard. I mm. of course well, that we exists. We should interview it about Carrie Thornley. Um <laughs> add a little bit in there. <laughs> The cyberpunk present find... is way more confusing yeah. than I was led to believe by playing Shadowrun yeah. as a kid. Well, it's part of, this is actually part of why it's confusing. So the basic idea of culture jamming is that you repurpose and co-opt symbols and figures of established power, turn them into memes, and use that to subvert capitalism. A good example of this would be the Billboard Liberation Front, who started hacking billboards in their terms in the 1970s. One of my favorite pieces of their work is an AT&T billboard, which originally said AT&T works in more places, and the BLF added, like NSA headquarters. Um, the Billboard Liberation Front and other culture jammers influenced and inspired a lot of modern activists and artists, but you might note they seem to have made a lot less progress in their culture jamming than late adopters on the right wing. Since 2014, when Gamergate roared to life in a hail of memes and repurposed bits of mass media, different once-fringed chunks of the radical right have forced their way into the mainstream, often co-opting not just the imagery of other artists like Pepe, but co-opting actual people to spread their message. In fact, we have evidence that Adbusters, perhaps the premier clearinghouse of leftist culture jamming up to the present day, was used by the alt-right as a textbook in their 2015-2016 meme operations. Aaron Gallagher was one of the very first researchers on this beat. In a medium write-up titled Alt-Right Culture Jamming, she cites a September 2015 poll post. Read Adbusters. Don't follow the left-hard propaganda, but look at the examples. And um, yeah, man, that's so frustrating. Ah, it's deeply frustrating. Um, I feel like the only I way to fight shit, it is earnestness. Like, I I don't know, Margaret. I think the, the the only way out is through. We have to we have to keep going. Just just keep posting harder. We're gonna do it eventually. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, it's one of two things. It's either uh, earnestness or it's getting things weird enough and fucking with people's heads enough that we make everybody a furry. And then people are too busy trying to make, you know, various genital sheaths for their fursuits 
to have a second civil war. But uh, see, I mean, they will be earnestly looking for genital sheaths for their fur suits. That's, that is the strength of the furry movement. It is an it's earnest just, thing that everyone else views mm-hmm. ironically. No, but this mm-hmm. is this is something actually I've been thinking about a lot the, the past week and how these these tactics, they, they do seem to be successful in the ways that the right uses them. The left and anarchists have seen success in these same tactics, but th- this this type of, like, in the last, previously in our series, we talked about, like, a determent versus recuperation, and how these, these two things, they're kind of, they're, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, actually. Like, they're kind of, they operate, they yeah. operate the, the same, and they both and same thing with like culture jamming they they all do contribute to this like fracturing and this opening up of reality but and what that does is that it, it creates these brief windows of opportunity where like reality is extremely malleable and it can be shaped by collective groups of people but yeah. w- so as these things are useful tactics for for creating these these areas of possibility and these and these and these small windows um and one one of the kind of risks of using these tactics, and we kind of saw this with Occupy, we saw this with a few other kind of very like, very culture jamming based movements, is that once this reality has been fractured in a specific way, if 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 we don't win this battle, it can never be attacked in the same way again. So like, as, if you if you're going to use these culture jamming tactics as as a part of a diversity of tactics to kind of affect reality to to open up these fractures, once once they've been once they've been attacked and if we lose this method of attack and this and the location of attack is going to be so much stronger than it was like pre the pre the fracture and yeah it's, it's like one you're of, fighting it's, the borg exactly and it's, it's one of these things where you have to be very careful when using these tactics because you could inadvertently you know make make the attack surface actually uh, you know much harder in the future if you don't actually you know, succeed at your goal. Well, um, it's it's the idea that like if you have to think about some of this stuff, like Operation Mindfuck, the way that like uh, a hacker would think of a zero day exploit. A zero day exploit is like basically a fuck up in code that can allow you like a method to get in and and you know access a thing that you're not yeah. supposed to access. But the instant you use it, the people who are responsible for defending whatever it is you're hacking will know what you've done and yep. fix it. So you can use a zero day once, right? You have to be careful about when you deploy something like that. And also, no, yeah, like like you have this thing where it's like okay, if if where we perceive reality is going from what Garrison was saying earlier, if where we perceive reality is like kind of a fixed point and you want to move that, but it's a pin stuck in the political map. The pin is stuck in the political map, and everyone who wants to change it wants to pull the pin out of the map so it can be moved. Mm-hmm. And the pin is now out of the map, but the problem mm-hmm. is is that everyone now can fight over the pin and move it. And so really, mm-hmm. you always want to pull the pin out of the map when you're positioned to be the one who can move it instead of the other yeah. team. Yes. Yeah, you got to be <laughs> fast on that shit. Um, and it's one of those things, obviously, in terms of like determining bastardry, there's there's bastardry in Carrie's personal life when it comes to what the Discordians were doing. I think it'd be a trap to fall into too much recrimination here. Yeah. Now, we know Carrie in particular was a reckless guy. Uh, this was not not a reckless thing to do. Operation Mindfuck. Um, that said, it's hard for me to blame an acid drenched young man and his friends for thinking that their extended joke about the John Birch Society would unleash a torrent of chaos upon the world. <laughs> Although I have to say, Eris at least is surely pleased. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. They did exactly what they said that they were going mm-hmm. to try and do, and it worked, yes. and they got shocked that it worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is interesting to note that whatever you want to say about their aims, the impact of the discourse in society and global politics and the course of mankind far outweighs any other real secret society that I can name. Like, objectively, they had more of an impact on politics than the real Illuminati. <laughs> they also succeeded in forcing their names into the story of the Illuminati forever. And as evidence of this, I want to read a quote to you from a wild-ass Illuminati conspiracy book by Jim Mars. It is critical at this point to understand that Illuminism is an ism, not unlike national socialism, Nazis, that's in that's in parentheses, communism, capitalism, and socialism. It is a belief system that is not relegated to any one individual or group in any given period of time. The beneficial goals of the Illuminati, such as freedom from ch- 
church dogma and government tyranny, lived on to modern times in France, America, and Russia. But the more sinister aspects of the order, such as inherent secrecy, duplicity, violence, and the drive for absolute power, lived on too in unscrupulous men. Robert Anton Wilson opined, The one safe generalization one can make is that Weishaupt's intent to maintain secrecy has worked. No two students of Illuminology have ever agreed totally about what the inner secret or purpose of the order actually was or is. As Wilson once fancifully told a radio audience, maybe the secret of the Illuminati is that you don't know you're a member until it's too late to get out. <laughs> it is, that is, such, it is that funnier is, that your audio cut out. <laughs> that is such a, that is such an interesting way to frame that, though. Yeah, mm-hmm. is that Robert uh, coming out as in the Illuminati to us, or is that Robert telling us that we're in it now? Mm, interesting, mm. interesting. Mm. Mm. Well, it's a decision for for everyone I mean, at home to make. That kind of just is like hindsight is twenty twenty though. Like you don't know how much you're gonna affect history or like reality until it's already happened. And even still, I don't think Robert Anton Wilson and the Discordian guys knew how much this stuff would be impacted because they they all died in the they all died in the early two thousands. And this mm-hmm. stuff like kind of reached reached the peak of its power from twenty sixteen to like the present. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that is that is. Uh, in a, a very a very concise way to 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 frame membership of the Illuminati. I would yeah. I would love to die before I find out that my life's work fuels all of my ideological enemies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that part's a bummer. I don't know. I I think about it a couple of ways. Um, one of them is that like as I think about Robert Anton Wilson's ideas of reality tunnels and pan agnosticism, I kind of think that one of the healthier terms that social media has given us is the idea of head canon, right? Which initially came out of like the fan fiction universe as a way of talking about like, well, I'm deciding this is true about star Wars or whatever, but you know, it's a term that gets used more broadly by people on the internet. And I think maybe even if you're talking about loopy stuff, when you use it, the idea that, this is canon that is inside my head as yeah. opposed to this is my view of reality is is maybe in a subconscious way an inherently healthier way to talk about shit. No, that's so true. I like that idea. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, that's a more or less complete history of the Illuminati. We did um, it. I love or that the actual we? history of the Illuminati is like there was this guy he wanted to be a nerd and the fucking Christians wouldn't let him. So he did some weird Christian looking science shit and that lasted for a little while. And then God struck one of them down and now there's fucking pyramids on the dollar bill and reality TV stars are the president. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is kind of the story of like two different groups of well-meaning nerds who like, fucked around in order to try to make the world a better place but the only language they had was lies and (laughs) so a number of problems were created as a result (laughs) yeah Uh, and that's why i i mean that's actually why i i believe i i think that like jokes and lies and and there's like some interesting and good shit that can be done through all this and but mm -hmm. i think that's why just like people being earnestly about what they're about feels like yeah um, much like headcanon as like a way to in- inure ourselves from this kind of nonsense. And I actually think we've been talking a lot about this, about how the different cultural weapons that the left and the right use to kind of get around each other, that these are not static battle lines and that tactics are adopted and altered and change over time. One of the things that made Trump potent and that made you know the alt-right and the initial trump movement potent was a fa- in fact a kind of honesty or at least authenticity and I, I talk about i've talked about this a few times over my career i had a series of interviews with um a guy rick wilson who was an objectively unpleasant man in a lot of ways uh he was one of the chief republican like dirty tricks media guys uh he did a lot of really ugly attack ads in the obama era um and then became an anti-trumper but like one of the things he will he would point out when he was and this was and i was talking to him as the election was going on and we were kind of analyzing the clinton campaign's ads as he was like these all feel like something somebody cooked up in a madison avenue ad 
com- agency because they are. And Trump ads feel like something some guy made on his computer at three in the morning after like slamming a bunch of monsters. And that's what worked about Trump. There's something authentic about that, that like tr- enraptured people because it felt more honest than the politicians we were used to. Um, it doesn't mean he was a fundamentally honest man, but there was a central honesty in his approach and like his willingness his unwillingness to even like pretend that he felt bad for doing bad things that was that that was that was like this authenticity that was an effective weapon in their quarrel and i think over the years they've gotten so up their own there's an extent to which i think they've gotten up their own asses about the you know saying the quiet part you know and and uh and and kind of like wrapping their actual intents and layers of subversion and all of this fuckery and I, I I think there's a degree to which that may have thrown people off who would have otherwise been uh, appealed to them. And I think there's also kind of the period we're seeing right now from the right is where they've they're discarding these tactics and they're trying authenticity again in terms of like, we're just going to straight up talk about wanting to erase transgender people from existence. We want to ban books. We want to make it illegal to to learn, you know, take AP african-american history all this kind of shit like the mask is kind of off and i think maybe they may be miscalculating and we have some early signs that they may that may be the case the degree to which that kind of authenticity is a selling point um and so yeah margaret i think there's a good chance that you're right in terms of like what our response needs to actually be because they're showing their faces now and um it's a pretty ugly one so maybe this is the time to to show ours rather than you know trying to uh uh make our little illuminati and and hide our enlightenment values from the people who can't possibly understand it well enough yet i don't know maybe yeah. and i think part of that has to do with like um you know uh, like many people who listen to this probably identify as liberals but there's a sort of joke that everyone hates liberals basically from all other every other position and also mm-hmm. possibly including the liberal position often and, yeah and I think that a lot of it has to do with this, like exp- having people be sort of wishy-washy or having people, yeah, not quite say what they're about, you know? And I don't know, just being like, yeah, I I've, I often see that you actually get more people, not necessarily agreeing with you, but able to make their own decisions about what where they agree with you and where they don't. When you're just like, well, this is what I'm about. Mm-hmm. What are you about? You know, instead of being like, oh, yeah, totally. This is how, I don't know, this like false. I, don't I, know I think it's a problem this. the media has, too, because by at least according to Gallup, public trust in the media, about 23 percent of the American population thinks that journalists uh, are basically <laughs> honest. Um, <laughs> like, so people do not believe that the media is telling them the truth. Like yeah. this New York Times idea of like the importance of, you know, honest, unbiased journalism. That is not a thing. And it's not a thing because no one believes you're unbiased. So the honest thing to do yeah. is not to be like, well, we can't have trans people reporting on trans or black people reporting on, you know, issues that affect the black community because they're biased. It's like, no, just like have people report on shit and be honest about what they believe. If you're a fucking yeah. Marxist or a fucking conservative walking into, you know, a protest or a movement or whatever X, tell people what you think about the world when you go to report on that thing. Obviously, like yeah. if you're reporting on like a tornado, your ideology is not important, but I would much rather <laughs> know where a fucking, yeah, wind. exactly. <laughs> yeah. That we don't need, we don't need to, you, we don't need to know that you like have a Marxist take on, on the economy or whatever. Yeah. If your job is to report on a hurricane, um, although maybe that'll influence the way you talk about like the, but whatever, how, how it Just, handle, yeah, how people handle it. Let, let, I mean, don't, like it, it's this it's the fact like the the reason people don't trust the media a big part of it is that it, you can't be an unbiased journalist it's yeah. simply not a thing that exists um in the same way that like the very way you see the world and the way that it feels to you even down to the way things taste is impacted by your expectations this is a biological reality that is undeniable your expectations your personal biases um everything including like how much sleep you've got the night before changes the way you interact with physical reality as does the things you believe so it's actually fundamentally dishonest to pretend that you're coming at anything from some sort of point of objectivity and everyone knows that at some level which is why nobody trusts journalists right that's my take 
And we we should work to like part of being open about our biases is to also kind of like no, okay, like my weak spot is that I want to believe yeah. that someone who calls themselves this or that label is fundamentally good or fundamentally bad. Yeah. And so I should be aware of my own biases even for myself yeah. so I can move towards objectivity. I mean, I, I have, when I went into this, this is the second version of this that I've done. The first one was a much shorter version that we did as part of a live show. And it was much less complicated and towards the Discordians and delved mm-hmm. into a lot less of this. And, uh, you know, that's part of it's because I these these guys were my heroes when I was a very young man. Yeah. And I didn't want in a lot of ways to learn things like the fact that Carrie Thornley attempted to molest a, a young girl. Yeah. Like that yeah. is an unpleasant thing to realize and have to adapt into because that, you know, that that actually does mean something about the things that he believed. Um, and one of the things that it means is that you should always be careful about how much you believe anything, right? Because yeah. belief can lead you to some very frightening areas, even if even if that is a belief in the value of love and, and you know, physical autonomy and stuff, right? Because that's how Kerry would describe the underpinning of the horrible thing that he did. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think we've probably talked enough uh, about this kind of stuff. Sure have. Or you, have you guys want to... Plug I, just, I can't stop doing the or have no, you. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, Sophie. By the way, when you sent me that text uh, last night, uh-huh. you know, saying saying that your your Uber wouldn't pick you up outside of the senator's house, and that you had a a, a hot firearm you had to discard. Um, did you ever wind up getting that Uber? Well, here's how we know your conspiracy is wrong. I would not take an Uber. I would call your ass. You, oh, you would you call gonna, a Lyft. Would, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I would, <laughs> Lyft. This has all been an extended ad for Lyft. <laughs> Lyft. If you're going to carry out what a political it, assassination, Man, it had better be in a Lyft. Sponsors. <laughs> Lyft. We do not ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> we seriously need to start offering that as, as mm-hmm. something that we do. Here at Lyft, we make sure every one of our drivers has a hidden area in the car that you can place a hot firearm. Lyft, we go the extra mile. Ridiculous. So anyway, shop Lyft. Anyways, Garrison, <laughs> Margaret, pluggables. Uh, if you want to look at my um, slightly unhinged ramblings about chaos magic, you can follow my Twitter account at Hungry Bowtie. Uh, as as is, as this is airing, I will probably probably be in Atlanta for the week of action, which is going on to uh, defend the forest there. Um, so, if you want to support people in Atlanta, you can donate to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund. I would say I have a two book novella series that came out a little while ago called the Danielle Kane series. The first one's "The Lamb Will Slaughter the Lion." Mm-hmm. The second one is "The Barrow Will Send What It May." They're both really short, and they deal with <sighs> more good magical. Titles stuff and more stuff about how we shape reality than some of my other writing so maybe you'll like them if you like this episode and you can get them wherever books are sold yeah read read those books because i have been using a series of fake cut out social media accounts in order to harass and threaten margaret into writing a third one (laughs) um but it's not working so help, help me out people um anyway This has been Behind the Bastards, a podcast about the Illuminati that also is the Illuminati. So whatever conspiracy you believe about me and my friends here on the show, it's probably real in some way. Happy 2023. Bye. (laughs) Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com or Check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.